a beautiful day to you out there watching us on Voice of One TV. Thank you for staying with us through the period of this minister's conference. We just wrapped up for the evening and we have someone amazing in the studio with us today who featured prominently in the event. I'm sure you want to meet our guests for this episode. So please stay with us. My name is Gaby Todo. Thank you for staying with us on The Exclusive. The Exclusive gives you an opportunity to meet with God's children and ministers of God and let us into their lives, how they began, what the journey in their work with God has been like. And of course, we have opportunity of gleaning wisdom from their work with God. Today with us in the studio is a prominent feature in the just concluded Ministers Conference 2024. He has been a regular feature in every episode of Ministers Conference here at Remnant Christian Network. Welcome with me, the set man of the Fortress Ministry, Joss Plateau State, North Central Nigeria, Apostle Gideon Oduma. It's nice to have you in the studio, sir. Thank you very much for Thank having Thank you for me. always coming whenever we call on you. My pleasure. All right. Yeah. You have been a regular feature at Ministers Conference right from the meeting episode and up to this moment. Can you comment on the progression of truths that have been coming from this amazing platform? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, again, um, the Minister's Conference has been a very helpful uh, offer or offering um, right from when it began. I remember just like you said, and um, I can say in brief that over the times, it has uh, come into fill a major gap, both in training uh, of those that are in ministry and just general believers um, for that matter. And then not just um, a gap in training, but also it's become a bit of a fellowship forum for ministers. Uh, it has also helped to bring clarity, uh, particularly doctrinal clarity in um, different areas of life and ministry and uh, belief. And then also it's been an opportunity to interact with elders in the faith. Okay. Uh, every year we try to have someone who is um, an elder, someone who is uh, much older, who's done ministry for much longer than uh, several of us have. And that has been a very unique addition to the richness of the ministers' conference every year because then they don't just speak from the standpoint of um, the understanding of God's word because they've read, but they also have the the backbone of experience. They've proven the word of God in their lives over time. They've made mistakes. They've learned from those mistakes. They've seen the word of God uh, work itself out in both their own lives and in the lives of others and so they bring a very unique uh, perspective to issues and it's also been a very critical uh, supply of God to the ministers conference that we are able to sit as a people and learn from people that have gone ahead in ministry so I would say that over the years it's uh, progressively have uh, brought that level of enrichment to the lives of uh, believers and then ministers in particular okay it began as with the name young ministers conference that i noticed the last three editions they removed the young and it became ministers conference what do you think accounted for that um it, it just so that it's not limiting okay. um, i think first and foremost uh, because the the focus is for those that are in ministry and those that uh, have a sense that God is calling them into ministry. Um, when you use the tag young minister, there's a bit of um, an ambiguity and some kind of bias. If you if you you know where, um, how do you define who is young? Is it young in age or is it young in ministry? Yes. So. So to just avoid all of those kinds of biases and the baggage of the ambiguity that can come with that qualifier, um, that's, that's why it's just best to leave it as ministers. Okay. 
Uh, during one of your sessions, the opening session precisely, you made mention of a statement and you, you, you reiterate that a lot in most of your sessions, that it is the qualifications for making heaven, is, <laughs> they are easier than the qualifications for coming into ministry. So now, look at the climate of, looking at the climate of ministry, particularly in our country, Nigeria and the globe at large, are you satisfied with the delivery of pulpit ministers today? It, it, this is um, it's a tricky question okay, because the, number one, what people understand as the ministerial landscape usually is the visible landscape, is a prominent landscape. Okay. And like I've always contended, majority of the pastors that you have in Nigeria um, are not famous, they are not popular, they are not known, um, they are ordinary uh, many of them actually live in poverty um, because we've got hundreds of uh, churches, thousands of churches actually across this country. So, um, but then there is something that is definitive, something that is representative. So I guess that's the sense in which you are talking about uh, delivery, uh, the delivery of ministry. So what I'm going to say is, I think that because of the spread of Pentecostalism and the uh, advance of the same, a lot of people that ordinarily do not have what you might call formal uh, ministerial training or theological training uh, have populated the, the landscape of ministry a lot. That has both its blessing and its challenges. Okay. Uh, the blessing in part would be the fact that they, they have not been over indoctrinated by any particular theological school of thought in that sense. Um, sometimes that kind of indoctrination that happens or just even call it teaching uh, what goes on in seminary sometimes can be a blessing and sometimes can be a challenge so these people usually have not been exposed to all of the sophisticated arguments that sometimes uh, hurt more than the help uh, from the seminaries and um, so there is this there's something about the the unbridled faith that they can bring to the landscape of ministry, which can be an infusion of very needed uh, uh, um, faith or very uh, needed outlook to doing ministry. When you are too calculated, too uh, premeditative, and then everything has to be prim and proper because of all the trainings you have received, sometimes that could be a real hindrance to the move of the spirit. Okay. So when you do have within that landscape people who do not have both the privilege and the baggage of that kind of training, sometimes, uh, um, ironically, it could become a blessing because then uh, they, they step out in faith because they don't know a lot of the other things you have been taught. And then they just believe certain things simply because it's written in God's word. And so it becomes a bit of a, an infusion of a challenging narrative to the practice of ministry. So I would say that uh, because of that, However, also, there's the challenge of having a lot of people who do not have some form of training coming into ministry, yeah. uh, both in terms of um, doctrine uh, and uh, delivery, as the case may be. Uh, but I think the biggest problem we have had, uh, maybe the two biggest problems we've had, I would say, as I look at the landscape, would be um, doctrine and life, basically. Okay. And both of them are critical. Uh, in the landscape, there is a lot of, uh, we have a lot of doctrinal challenges, but I think that as bad as that is, what would be equally bad is the fact that there's been a lot of moral failing uh, in the landscape of ministry. And I really can't say which is worse than the other. I think both of them are as bad as each other. So um, my assessment is that, yes, in a large number of cases, we don't know most of the pastors that are laboring because they are just not known. They are not popular. Uh, many of them are breaking their backs in ministry in some of the remote places around the world or around the country. So it may not be very uh, fair to, to pass a judgment that would be based on just the 
ministers that have become popular, which means they have become representative in the minds of the people of what ministry is like. But the reality is more nuanced than that, which is that there are a lot of faithful people that are laboring unknown across, you know, cities, villages, towns, all over this country and um, uh, across the continent of Africa. The sad thing I would say really is just that I think that when you look at the the, the prominence, the prominent landscape or the ministers that are in, that are prominent, which then become the face of ministry in quote, um, across the land, it's a mixed bag. Uh, there's the good, as they say, there's the bad and there's the ugly. And yeah. I do think that um, the bad and the ugly um, currently seem to be pulling more weight than the good. Okay, and then you are an, a strong Christian apologetic and you Thank advocated you. strongly in your teaching that we need to arise and defend the gospel the way we so learn Christ. Are you disappointed with this current level of ministers, the way we seem to avoid the controversies that the charlatans are putting up today, the ones who are misrepresenting the kingdom, the way we seem to run away from arguments? Are we defending the faith enough? Um, that, that, that's also another tricky question. <laughs> uh, it's tricky because it's maybe just sensitive. It's quite sensitive, partly also because the landscape is populated by so many people that are driven more by just a, a simple emotional approach to doing ministry. Um, uh, because again because of the things we have been taught over the times i would say to answer your question i would say that um i don't think that a lot of people realize that they contend for what they believe as much as they do everybody contends for what they believe um, sometimes when people try to stop you from uh from contending they are just not aware that they are contending. In the very act of trying to stop somebody from speaking up or calling out a wrong teaching or a wrong teacher, you are, that's the irony. The irony is that you are doing exactly what you are trying to prevent people from doing. Yes. It's just that many times it doesn't strike people that that's what they're doing. So it's, it's like judging somebody for judging somebody. It's like saying, um, it is wrong to judge, okay? Um, in order for you to say, why are you judging? It's not right for you to judge. In order to know that somebody has judged, you also have had to judge them to conclude that their action constitutes judgment. It's, it's judgment. So if it is absolutely uh, uh, inappropriate to judge, then you shouldn't be saying what you are saying because you also have, um, you've processed their action and you have passed a judgment on it. And the outcome of your judgment is that they are being judgmental. But you are trying to say to them that they should not judge. So in, in terms of contending for the faith, there is a smoke screen, all right? It's a smoke screen, really, because it doesn't really cut deep. It's a smoke screen that feels like, no, we shouldn't talk. We, you, you know, we should just focus on what God has called us to do. We shouldn't focus on what, it, what other people are saying. Just preach what God is giving to you. Just focus on your own truth. Well, if people believed that, they wouldn't be saying it. Because when you are telling people to focus on what God is giving them to do and they shouldn't bother about what other people are doing, the very, that very exercise is you bothering about what other people are doing. Okay. It's almost a bully strategy yes. where you are trying to say, I'm the only one that can do this thing. Nobody else should do it. Because telling people to stop talking and to focus on their ministry in order to do that, you would be talking and you will be focusing on other people's ministry, which are the exact things you are trying to say people should not do. So that's more like at the, um, I don't know, maybe let me just say that's at the philosophical level. A lot of people don't see that that's what they're doing. But at the front end, I would say that 
yes there isn't um, a lot of constructive biblical engagement with error going on in the landscape um, and the reason i say so is because of all the other things i've said so the, the water is modeled a lot of people don't know they are doing what they are doing and because they don't know they're doing it then they are not really uh, putting a lot of thought into what it is that they are doing there's a lot of errors going on in the land and um, because of social media and all of that everybody can be everywhere now yes. and then um nobody everybody anybody now can bypass the traditional gatekeepers that is to say you don't really need anybody to give you permission to be heard yes. unlike back in the day where where you really you know it wasn't as easy as it is today you can come out of nowhere and and hold the attention of a nation yes. so because of that everybody's everywhere everybody's uh, uh, social media account is almost now a pulpit or a platform or a megaphone if you like mm -hmm. therefore there, there is a sense in which there is so much going on that even to track everything that is being said it's not going to be easy yeah. so you only get to hear the loud ones and then when that happens you then see that a lot of people are not decided on what they think the bible says the believer should do yeah. so should we approach these things should we speak about them should we speak about the people who are saying the things or we should just talk about what they they are teaching and forget about the people teaching them there are all those arguments going on all over the place and so i would say because of all of that the landscape is quite muddy the water is really quite muddy that even people that are trying to do something constructive in that regard their voices might be drowned yeah. in all of the cacophony that goes on all over the place so in general i would say there hasn't been sufficient um engagement with error in a way that holds the attention of the church in the way that the attention of the church should be held all right thank you sir and then there is this school of thought now because of this emerging issues that believe that there should be a setup to vet preachers pulpit preachers to uh decipher who is real and who is fake but I, I would like you to comment on that when we return from the break if you are just joining this is exclusive and we are hosting apostle gideon odoma he was a major resource person in the just concluded ministers conference 2024 so when we return he will hear his thoughts with regards to whether preachers should be vetted pulpit preachers in nigeria and beyond for the love of great conversations, real and inspiring stories, we bring you exclusive on Voice of One TV. I am Jane Emmanuel. My name is Ehiguchu Agi. I am Abi Manuel. I yes. am Arita Zwa Gay Itodo. On exclusive, we explore the life, experiences, and ministries of people who have a working relationship with God through inspiring stories and divine encounters. And so the strongest tool of a disciple is an accurate life. Now, prior to this time, I wasn't willing to do ministry because I was making money. I've handled his work with all humility and gratitude. I feel so humbled by God trusting me with some things. A man who has gotten God's word in the prayer closet mm -hmm. neither mm -hmm. seeks nor expects encouragement from men. Many a times, God will even use your diligence in your academics to also prepare you for ministry. If you refuse to be pure at the end of the age the bible says it will separate the sheep from the goats so join us for insightful conversations and spiritual revelations that will inspire and uplift you good to know you are still there this is the exclusive voice of one television my name is gabi todo and i am hosting today god's servant the set man of fortress ministry just plateau state nigeria apostle gideon odoma so just before we went on the break i was asking him his thoughts with regards to preachers being vetted because of the present conditions we have particularly in nigeria where anybody just sets up a pulpit and begin to churn out what they believe God has called them to. A lot of people on social media and beyond have advocated that preachers be vetted, that there should be a structure set up to prune and find out who is genuine from the fix. What are your thoughts on that? Um, it's, it's something that has been 
proposed at different times yes. and in different places and it's been experimented also okay. uh, in different places i do think that is still too quite um, broadly stated and uh, by that i mean they see a lot of um, vagueness to it if you want to set up such a system would it be set up by the churches would it be set up by government maybe you could even clarify so the the people advocating this who exactly do they think should be responsible for they are advocated up. that the government should do the setup with the input of the church okay monitoring bodies like can and pfn okay um so that's where that's where things get very very uh, delicate pretty fast number one uh, the church yes if you have church organizations or coalition of denominations uh, that could make something like that work there is a possibility that it could become something helpful um, where it becomes absolutely absolutely dangerous is when you bring the government into it okay um i would say and i don't think i have the time on this show to be able to argue that but i would argue very strongly that a government has no business at all um getting in the business of what preachers preach in that sense um particularly when it has to do with doctrine i know that almost every country has laws around uh, hate speech and that kind of thing which is pretty much um uh, clearly understandable but because that's not the proper domain of doctrine right uh, so maybe things like in, inciting people to violence uh, speech, speeches that uh, promote uh, hate of particular demographic of people or gender whatever those kinds of uh, speech uh, forms uh, are known to be unacceptable by everybody and i'm saying they do not constitute a uh, doctrine in that sense they are not in the purview of proper doctrine so those are already accounted for in the laws of almost every country uh, including in the laws of this country so if you incite people to violence there's already a lot to take care of that it doesn't matter whether you're a preacher or you're not a preacher so uh, that is as far as the government can go and should go getting government involved in the business of the content of what churches teach and preach is a very dangerous route to take okay uh, however you go about it um you because it assumes a lot it assumes that the people who are in power the people who are in government are always going to have the best motive for letting this kind of system be in place so what happens if you have a certain government where the powers that be within the government are such that um let's just say to be very dramatic let's say there are people that believe that the exact opposite of true doctrine is true doctrine so that they make rules that criminalize the actual true doctrine you see the problem is not the system at that level the problem is that these systems are run by people and so if you entrust such a, a system into the hands of people at a particular time maybe you know that the intention is good the motive is right and the people are going to pursue the right course of action but once that system is in place if somebody else comes into it tomorrow who is an actual enemy of the church the person could use the system the same system and simply change the rules and to say from this time going forward if you say that jesus is the only way to god that is no more acceptable now because this agency or whatever has been empowered to to regulate what the preachers and the churches or pastors can preach and what is not acceptable it, it will not become difficult on such a day when somebody rises up and then they are now calling black white and they are calling white black so um and, and i do think that biblically also there is no reason for the church to succumb to government trying to lord over the church in, with regards to what is proper and what is improper government shouldn't have any hand in that the church should be lighting the world and salting the earth 
uh, it will be too, it, it, it's, it's going to be catastrophic. Uh, there are all kinds of philosophical reasons for that. I don't want to go into that. But okay. secondly, the church. In Nigeria, you have organizations or agencies um, or corporations, if you like. I mean that in the non-formal sense, like CAN, Christian Association of Nigeria. You have PFN, the Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria. Yes. Those are the kinds of bodies that I think are better positioned to be able to attempt the kind of regulatory exercise that people are proposing. However, because of the fundamental right of association that people have, you really do not have the right to determine how, what group of people who are meeting somewhere on a Sunday morning should be able to meet or not. We are not in a dictatorship. Okay. Neither is can a dictatorship. So when you have that kind of uh, uh, arrangement, in order for it to work, number one, it's going to take time. And number two, it's going to be, uh, its power is going to be based on a, a morality or a, the moral force that it is able to pull. Let me explain that. Okay. So I mean that you need to have a body, for instance, that is so... Uh, that is seen to be on the side of truth, that is seen to be dispassionate, and that is seen to, uh, to be impartial, and that is seen to be constituted by people of the highest uh, uh, standing, the highest reputation, the highest integrity, so that what would happen would be such that when people commit themselves to joining those bodies, that kind of a body, um, gradually it becomes, there's a reputation around the body that now makes other people suspect to say, these guys are so good, they stand for the truth, okay? Yeah. They are such an exemplary, uh, 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 as they are an association of exemplary ministers and ministries. So, if you are reluctant to join them, okay, they shine such a light that your refusal or reluctance to join them already passes a kind of moral vote, okay, on you that is not going to be uh, uh, in the best of light, M making it look like if you have nothing to hide, there's no reason why you wouldn't be here. Okay. You get it? So the way that that kind of a body could even work is going to be by its own track record of integrity. Yeah. So it has to be something that is built from the ground up over time, and then it earns that place. It's, 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 it's something that is earned. It wouldn't be something imposed, and it ends it in the society such that it now becomes the case that you will have an explanation, an explaining to do if you are reluctant to join because of how transparent it is. So even at that level, therefore, the body is still not going to be able to force people to join it, but they would have become such a colossus, such, such, such a system that is transparent, that is rooted in integrity, that has such a high reputation that it now forces people to want to join if they have nothing to hide. And then gradually, that kind of separation begins to show up between those that want to pursue ministry with integrity and those that do not want to pursue it. So the judgment would be more like um, a social kind of judgment, a moral judgment that people now blacklist you, if I may use that word, mm -hmm. just because you don't want to join right. these people, even if they don't know exactly what you may be doing wrong. But it would be to say, these guys are so good, this system is so beautiful, it's so in you know, it's so upright that for you to not want to join means there's certainly something you want to hide. So you see, it's a bit of a yeah, windy it's, way. It's actually, uh, okay, to, we're, to we're, we're almost out of time now. Just yeah. just before we go, there's this matter I really needed to nail <laughs> <laughs> before I let you go. All right. What is the ideal way to correct a preacher that is considered to be in error?
now Jesus gave a, a, a model yeah. that if a brother sins against you, you should approach him one on one and first discuss the, your issues with him. Yeah. If he doesn't listen to you, get one or two elders. So is the, the best approach would it be to seek an audience with the erring preacher and say this thing you are teaching? Uh, I think it's not biblical. And then when the person fails, before you go to your pulpit and mention his name, what do you think is the best approach? That's desirable, but that's not required, uh, straight up. Um, the pronouncements of Jesus in those passages in Matthew chapter 18 and following, all right, uh, deals with interpersonal relationships. Okay. It's, it has nothing to do with uh, ministry, with preaching and all of that, because ministry is public ministry. Ministry okay. is public. Jesus was dealing with interpersonal, interpersonal relationship. Okay, um, if if we have a contract and then you violate it, there was an agreement we made. Then I come to you and talk to you. That's what Jesus is saying. If you don't want to heed to my objections, then I bring a brother or two in. If you don't want to heed, then I call the church in, the leadership of the church. So you see, this is very interpersonal kind of setting that okay. really the church is now like where we are ending up in the in the progression meanwhile for pulpit ministry related issues it actually begins in the church okay okay and it's 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 ministry to the public so it, it, it because it is a public ministry scenario that principle while is not wrong I'm saying it's not required. The principle of one-on-one, -on -one, then pick two people to join you before you go to church is just not required at that level. Now, it is, however, um, I advisable to use that also if you do have a personal relationship with the person in question. Right. Now, we live in an internet age where the person who is spilling this error, for instance, might be in New Jersey, in the United States of America. But because there's Facebook, there's YouTube, there's uh, Twitter, X. you know, X, whatever is out there, this person could begin to affect demographics in Nigeria even though he's never been to Nigeria and these Nigerians have never been there. And it's not likely that you who is observing this whole scenario, you don't even have that direct access to the person okay. to be able to say, oh, bro, let's sit down and, you know, let me call your attention to something. So it's really not, uh, many times it's not tenable. Direct to the question, should we correct um, errors um, by mentioning, by mentioning names, the answer is yes. It's the, there's a biblical model for that. Jesus basically says in Matthew chapter seven, uh, he says, "Beware of false prophets." Okay. All right. Um, he didn't just say beware of false prophecies. Beware of the prophets. You cannot beware of people you do not know. Okay. All right. So there is a place for dealing with the error that is taught. And sometimes it might be necessary to deal with the people teaching the errors. And it will usually be a matter of some kind of moral judgment. It's not casting stone. But I think that, number one, you look at the seriousness of the error. Does it affect the fundamentals of our faith? Does it touch the heart of the gospel? Uh, matters of faith, matters of redemption, matters of salvation. Does it affect soteriology? Does it affect people's relationship with God? Does it affect the person of God or Jesus Christ? Christology, okay? Um, the, the divinity of Jesus. Those kinds of serious issues that are the heart of the faith, when those are the matters that have been wrongly presented, it, it, it's more serious because then it can it can subvert the fate of people. Okay, okay. as opposed to more marginal issues, you know, like should should ladies wear uh, trousers or should they should they have something over their head when they walk through the church? You know, those kinds of things um, are not as central to salvation as some of the other things I've mentioned. Yes. So you want to look at the seriousness of the error. You want to look at at the consistency with which these errors have been taught. Is this a one-off thing? Is this something, does this person, has he only just said something that you think is erroneous? You know, here and there, very sparsely, and then it's like, he's normally doing good, but then he has this uh, blind spot, maybe, okay? okay? So, is it something that is becoming a pattern? Is somebody developing a reputation for teaching errors, or is it something that is happening like once in a while here and there? That's also important. Um, then you want to look at, sometimes you want to look at the reach that the person has. Okay. What is the capacity for 
uh, what is the capacity for destroying the faith of people that this person has? If the person is reaching a very wide audience, it might also call for attention more than someone who is, you know, just speaking to the choir in that sense. Okay. Um, uh, so, so these are some of the kinds of issues you weigh in order to decide whether you want to go all the way from talking about the error to talking about the person who is dishing out the errors. Paul in his ministry, particularly in the first two, in the first, in the two epistles he wrote to Timothy, okay, first and second Timothy, Paul mentions the name of about eight people. Six of them were New Testament figures. Okay, he mentions James and Jane and Jambres, yeah. who were in the days of Moses. Okay, yeah. uh -huh. but he mentions a whole lot of other people. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. yes, exactly. Philetus. Uh, he talks about Alexander the coppersmith, yeah. or right, that done him a lot of harm. <laughs> Those are people who were alive at the time. He was calling their names. Okay, okay. Um, and he, he was even saying what they have done. And on some occasions, he told Timothy to have nothing to do with the person because the president had done him harm so emotionally i can hear people saying things like you know just deal with the issues and avoid the person but jesus says to avoid the people now a final thing maybe just because of time would be to say that part of why this becomes delicate is because everybody's everywhere i have if if i pastor a church it's my responsibility to tell the people that god has given me uh oversight over to say please avoid this place avoid that place okay. because when you go they are not going to get good pasture for instance the problem however is that the social media for instance mm -hmm. so whatever you say to 20 people might be heard mm -hmm. by 20 million people yes. and so the issue of authority is what I'm trying to deal with here. Like, okay. who gives you the right to tell everybody who not to listen to? Because that comes up. Well, the point is, most times, you are probably not trying to tell everybody. Yes. You are really trying to talk to the people that you have direct oversight over. But because of the nature of the way the platforms work. Yeah, the bloggers. It, exactly. Everybody's <laughs> going to pick it up. Something you said in a midweek service, somebody's going to stumble on it and is going to amplify it. And then people are going to come up and they are going to be like, who is he to be telling us who we can listen to and who we cannot listen to? Who is he? Well, he wasn't really talking to you. Okay. Maybe he was actually talking to the 25 people that he passed us and he's trying to keep them away from straying into dangerous waters. And the other person that has spoken that error may have been teaching the error to his own 15 members. <laughs> but again, there's internet. Yeah. And so once something is out in the public space, it is okay to address it in the public space. Okay. That's 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 really uh, a, a a quick way to try to. Wow, you have done uh, you have done justice to this question. <laughs> you have done justice to this question. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much. sir. You're and we, we really do want to appreciate you for standing for the faith. Thank you. Very you have much. been doing so much on your social media space. Thank you. And with the large followership that God has blessed you and, and which is still on the increase, you have been doing so well defending the faith and we pray that God strengthens you more. Amen. We love you from Voice of One TV and we pray that God keeps upholding your hand. Amen. And thank you for standing by our Father in the Lord, the CEO of Voice of One TV, always standing with him in upholding the gospel. A pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much, Voice of One, for everything you do. Yes. Uh, it's always a joy and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So keep up the good work. Thank you so much. God bless you. I have been talking with the set man of the Fortress Ministry, just plateau state north central nigeria apostle gideon odoma he was one of our resource persons that just concluded ministers conference 2024 and he has lent credence to a lot of rising issues with regards to controversies that emanate from the pulpit here in our country and beyond and i believe you've learned a lot do stay tuned on this tv station because more is coming your way on this same program the exclusive i remain gabi todo god bless you and you have a lovely week ahead Epistle to the Apostles in the Marketplace. This is not a compendium produced by Closeted Research. It is a boot on the ground testimony of Jesus Christ about the endless possibilities that abound in embracing and executing God's kingdom and his righteousness within the gamut of the marketplace. This book is therefore a clarion call and an apostolic manifesto laden with the Lord's marching orders to all the Lord's apostles whose duty posts are in the marketplace of the nations. To order your copies in the United States, phone number plus one five zero seven 
479-6333. In Ghana, phone number plus 233-548-491-524. Kenya, phone number plus 254-790-923-812. In the United Kingdom, phone number plus 44-740-029-5511. Or online at www.believersbookshop.co.uk. In Nigeria, phone number plus 234-803-803. 356-9841. For those outside the list of countries above, they can order for both hard and soft copies from Amazon by entering the link below. Amazon.com forward slash author forward slash Arome Osai underscore books. For those who want to order soft copies in Nigeria, Okadabooks.com forward slash user forward slash iron pen.